as we were going across the border, I heard a motorcycle that turned out to be a young security guard riding a patrol and he pulled a gun on me and I had to uh, defend myself uh, sufficiently enough to render him harmless and to take his gun away. Welcome back to I Spy. I'm crime reporter Natalie O'Brien and this podcast is a glimpse into the mysterious and often dangerous world of private eyes. In this episode, we meet someone who has been dubbed the Retriever. I know it it would have been a difficult case to uh, succeed. It would have had to have been a real commando-style entry and commando-style raid to get those children out. Have you ever wondered what an actual real-life private investigator is like? Well, that's what I'm trying to find out in this podcast. Each episode, you will hear these guns for hire talk about their most fascinating and hair-raising cases. Today, you will meet Keith Shafirius, who has dedicated his career to rescuing kidnapped children. It wasn't time to turn around because uh, police were in the area, so I just crashed through the, uh, the barricade and kept going. And then I was chased by the police heading back towards the border of uh, Germany. And at one stage, we're doing 170 kilometres an hour. Uh, It was late evening, and all I could see was the police blue lights flashing, getting further and further behind, because their old cars back in the 90s didn't didn't do 170 k an hour. And I beat them uh, to the border, had the little girl hidden under the seat of the car. Keith is Australia's most experienced private eye. The former airman turned spy, turned investigator, specialises in rescuing abducted children. His incredible career has taken him around the world. He has been shot at, chased by police, jailed and forced to pay bribes as he reunited more than 100 children with their families. His missions have included clandestine meetings with CIA contacts, arranging forged passports, and winding up on an international wanted list. Keith has even successfully posed as a movie producer to get close to a compound where two children were being held. And we set up a plan, or you could call it a sting. We set up as movie producers registered a name in Hollywood, Hollywood Capers. We had business cards. We carried a movie script with us. It was a script from some old movie that uh, uh, had all sorts of uh, things about the Middle East and that in it. It is every parent's nightmare. The heart-stopping moment when a child can't be found. Where are they? Have they gone missing? Or worse, have they been abducted? Child abduction in Australia is much more common than you might think. About 300 children a year are abducted and taken in and out of the country. And even when parents have lawful custody, it can be difficult and dangerous to get a child back. We uh, went for a drive one day and stopped on the road just out from some uh, missiles that were loaded and uh, pointed and the uh, driver with us uh, indicated if we stopped there we'd end up with handcuffs on so we knew what he meant and uh, we hired some young drivers uh, who were hanging around the hotel and they had four-wheel drive vehicles I paid them one dollar per day to drive us around and they took us to uh, where we thought the children were and uh, I found the children, I photographed the children looking through the window up on the first floor of this building and uh, I went to knock on the door to go inside and uh, about 10 or 12 young men came out, all had guns and knives, they surrounded us and a fairly dangerous situation. The Hague Convention is the international agreement that covers parental child abduction and helps parents get their children back. It gives parents an official process to follow, but it doesn't always provide the results needed. So desperate parents often turn to private investigators like Keith when authorities have been unable to help. But before he accepts a case and devises a plan, the one question he always asks is, 
How far would you go to get your child back? Their answer is normally, as far as I have to go, I will spend every last dollar. I will go anywhere just to see my children and get my children back. And there's many times they don't have the funds and I'll work uh, uh, pro bono on uh, uh, some of the cases. Is that because you feel so strongly about what's happened? I do, and after I assess a case, I accept about uh, three out of five cases that I believe the children are with the wrong parent or partner, and uh, that's the reason I accept those cases. How many children would you say that you've recovered in Australia? In Australia, it's around about 60 or 70. Internationally, it's uh, uh, 37 or 38 from uh, various countries. Not all for Australian families, but for uh, uh, American, Canadian, British and uh, a Fijian family. The key to his success is a worldwide network of trusted contacts who can be relied on to help get him and his young charges out of tight spots. I've had publicity worldwide and uh, through the World Association of Detectives who has about uh, almost a thousand members worldwide. A lot of them are uh, uh, ex-intelligence people, CIA, uh, military, uh, police and uh, all are listed as private investigators. And I've built a reputation uh, unsurpassed, I believe, that uh, I do what I say I'm going to do. I don't leave people high and dry in a country and not able to get them out across the border. And what what could we say your success rate would be? My success rate is better than uh, 95%. I have the contacts who uh, assist and in various countries where uh, intelligence people know about me through the association and they go out of their way to assist. Uh, Presently I have some cases in uh, uh, Russia and I have people assisting there. I don't even have to go there on this occasion because uh, they will do it on my instruction from Brisbane. When children are kidnapped by a parent... Top secret escape plans and inside help are often crucial to getting them back. Keith always warns his clients not to discuss the recovery with anyone. Secrecy is the key to success. Some of his current cases are focused on extracting children from Russia, but sometimes it can be a waiting game. Keith often has to wait and watch until the time is right to launch a recovery operation. organised that case about three years ago. Uh, It was fairly straightforward, but without the assistance of the Russian intelligence people, I would not have been able to get them out. We took them across the border into Turkey and then by sea across to one of the Greek islands and eventually back to the United States. Uh, The other ones uh, are being hidden in, uh, in Moscow and I know where they are. I have them under surveillance uh, week by week. So when we're ready to go in there after the weather warms up and COVID eases off, uh, should be a fairly simple case. That's quite a, an exit route for the case you talked about, getting them across the border into Turkey and then to the Greek islands. Um, that must have taken a lot of planning it uh, it it did, but uh, when you go into Turkey and down to uh, uh, the seaside resort Bodrum, I think it is, the Greek island of Kos is only, uh, you can see it from the beach, it's only about 5k off the beach and we, we used a speedboat to get across there and then flew from there to Athens. Keith has had his share of dangerous missions, but the most hair-raising trip was to the Middle East. Keith was arrested, jailed and then deported from Yemen without the children he'd got in there to retrieve. But he managed to sneak back in, risking his life in a bid to find a young brother and sister taken by their father. I think the most dangerous was into Yemen and as people realise, Yemen is not a nice uh, nice country, in particular in Aden and Sana'a. The children, two children, were abducted from the United States, taken from the mother who resided in uh, uh, Washington, 
Tacoma in Tacoma, Washington, and uh, were taken off to Yemen by the father. He didn't want the children. It was just to spite the mother. The children were uh, left in Aden with relatives, and the father went off to Sanaa to his uh, family and to work there had no idea where the children were, so uh, to get into uh, Yemen, uh, an associate investigator from the United States, uh, Logan Clark, uh, came with me. I met Logan in the US, and we set up a plan, or you could call it a sting. Uh, We set up as movie producers, registered a name in Hollywood, Hollywood Capers. We had business cards. We carried a movie script with us. It was a script from some old movie that uh, uh, had all sorts of uh, things about the Middle East and that in it. And we changed uh, various names and so forth. And that was the first thing uh, we were challenged with when we uh, went into Yemen as why we were there. And when I first went in, of course, I went to fly in from uh, Abu Dhabi and uh, had a problem. I didn't have a visa. It was hard to get a visa, and you could only get it either at the uh, doorstep of the flight or when you arrived there. Well, there was attendant, an attendant on the flight who said he would help me when we got to uh, Aden. Guess what? He was the first person off and he disappeared. I was left to myself. I was arrested. I was put in jail and uh, spent a week in jail in, uh, in Yemen. And uh, then I was deported to uh, back to Abu Dhabi. I saw my friend there who's the son of the... Uh, king, the son of the ruler of uh, Abu Dhabi, and I was able to get a different passport, different documentation, and the required uh, uh, documents to go back. I went back and stayed there for a further four weeks working on locating the children, and uh, uh, various dangerous things happened. We uh, went for a drive one day and stopped on the road just out from some uh, missiles that were loaded and uh, pointed and the uh, driver with us uh, indicated if we stopped there we'd end up with handcuffs on so we knew what he meant and uh, we hired some young drivers uh, who were hanging around the hotel and they had four-wheel drive vehicles I paid them one dollar per day to drive us around and they took us to uh, where we thought the children were and uh, I found the children, I photographed the children looking through the window up on the first floor of this building and uh, I went to knock on the door to go inside and uh, about 10 or 12 young men came out, all had guns and knives, they surrounded us and a fairly dangerous situation but was able to convince them that uh, we were movie producers and would be using that area as a location and that we were location scouting for uh, later on. So we told them they could have a part in the movie and they would be paid, and that pretty much calmed them down, would you believe? But any uh, moving on a little, the mother got sick and she... uh, uh, we had to medivac her out back to uh, uh, Abu Dhabi. Turned out she had a stomach cancer. The stress had brought it on. This story had a tragic sequel in the pirate-infested waters between Africa and Yemen. The Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden are among the most dangerous sea crossings in the world. Many people have tried to make the journey but not survived. The treacherous waters claimed another two lives when the children's desperate mother attempted to get back into Yemen without Keith. She was to contact me. I was back in Australia. She was to contact me once she was out of hospital, but she didn't. She met some British uh, ex-commando guy who said he would go and do it all for her, go with her. And uh, so they tried to go back. They went to Djibouti in North Africa. When they were crossing the Red Sea, they disappeared and they have never been seen or heard of since. So she was obviously uh, killed or exterminated or or whatever. But the uh, most rewarding part, last year, I received a telephone call 
from a guy in the United States who said, you probably won't uh, remember me, but you came to Yemen to rescue me in 1993. Uh, I'm now back in the United States with my sister. I'm, I'm in the Marines. I have a great future. Do you have any memorabilia from when you went to Yemen to rescue us? And I said, would you believe I do? Uh, sitting right on my desk, there's a, uh, a photograph of a page of the Bible where your mother had crossed out various names and put my name in place of those names, that I was the only saviour she had, the only person she could rely on. And that has sat on my desk in front of me for the last 25 years. So I was able to send that to him. And I also had some video footage uh, that I could send to him and his sister regarding me. Uh, attempted rescue. So they, they grew up in Yemen with their father or with their relatives, but as soon as they were old enough, they went back to the United States because they were uh, born in, in the US. So it was a fantastic uh, ending, but a sad uh, earlier on when, when the mother disappeared. Yeah, that's a terrible story about the mother. She never got to be reunited with her children. Was there any investigation into her disappearance? None whatsoever. There was no investigation, not by the United States. Uh, well, there was no one else to investigate, but it was ble- believed uh, just lost at sea. I look at that as one of the, one of the failures uh, of the, uh, you know, the 5% failures that I had. It's also one of the, it highlights one of the dangers of what you actually do, doesn't it? That, that's correct, and uh, yeah, I was followed. Uh, I knew I was under surveillance, and uh, we had uh, conned, for want of a better word, conned the minister for the interior in uh, in Yemen, and he used to come to the hotel and drink a lot of whiskey. He, you know, they they don't drink out on the street, so he assisted a lot or as much as he could. And the day we left Yemen, we left him absolutely blotto, drunk in the hotel and uh, left, left the airport so as we could, uh, we could get out. Right. Do you know what happened to him? No. Uh, he probably sobered up and went back to his post and uh, uh, continued to be the Minister for the Interior. Hopefully. <laughs> for his sake. Um, when you're looking to get children out of a foreign country, do you do that? Do you first look at um, getting official documentation for them? Is that an option? The, well, it's an option, but usually the uh, the legal uh, uh, representatives for the client do that through the Hague Convention uh, and, and lawyers and get legal documents. But those documents are uh, usually not recognised in uh, a lot of countries, even if they are a signatory under the Hague Convention. Some of the countries like Russia don't uh, adhere to it. They don't recognise it. And uh, one, uh, one or two other countries... Uh, don't recognise those documents. And then there was a desperate attempt to retrieve a five-year-old boy taken illegally out of Australia to the Philippines by his mother. The Swedish father, with the help of Keith and a PI from the US, Logan Clark, launched a mission to get him back. The case was complicated by the wealthy and powerful family of the estranged wife. One case I had uh, in the Philippines where this a uh, Swedish guy married a Philippine girl in Australia. She was an Australian citizen. I had a son, and she 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 went back to the Philippines and uh, hid hid the son in various uh, secure compounds. The Swedish legal aid system accepted his uh, his case. He had no money, and under the Hague Convention, they had all of the documentation. But we couldn't find the little boy, and if we did, he'd disappear again. To make the whole thing even more dangerous, hitmen have been hired to guard the boy and have orders to shoot the father and anyone with him on sight. Here is Logan Clark, one of the other men working on the case. If she goes with us, and I try to explain to my contacts, all of the power and the attention of this family is going to be focused on one thing, us. And somebody's going to get a bullet in the head. I spent four or five weeks there. My associate spent almost a year in the Philippines and the Swedish legal aid system, once they accept a case, they fund it to the end. 
they funded to the extent of 1.4 million US dollars. Not all to us, of course, but to lawyers, and I paid a bribe of 100,000 to a, uh, a person in the Philippines to locate the little boy. They located the little boy on an island in the home of an even wealthier family friend. Keith and Logan did a reconnaissance helicopter flight over the island to see if there was any way they could land, grab the boy and get out without anyone being shot. We flew in a military helicopter at, uh, at no cost over the compound to see if we could see the little, uh, little child, but uh, we never ever got him out and uh, he grew up in the Philippines and went back to his father as a teenager back into uh, Sweden. When you can't get a child out with official documentation, how is it do you look for an escape route? What do you think about when you're putting that kind of escape plan together? It, it can't be through a usual uh, entry exit uh, area. It has to be across a border where uh, where it's not manned and you know, where there's roads. Now, going from uh, from Poland on the few cases I've done in Poland, I, I found a border crossing uh, that was well away from the, the usual place and was able to uh, go to the border on one side, walk across, uh, and there were still fences there and some old observation towers, and then walk, walk across the no man's land. And I had a car hidden in a shed on the uh, uh, on 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 the other side of the border, so we could uh, get to there. And on uh, one particular occasion, uh, as we were going across the border, I heard a motorcycle, and it turned out to be a young security guard uh, riding a patrol, and he confronted me and wanted passports. Uh, and so forth and why we were crossing the border there and not at an official place and uh, he pulled a gun on me and I had to uh, defend myself uh, sufficiently enough to render him harmless and to take his gun away but we, we got away and uh, got the child into uh, back into Germany and uh, back to Australia. In a very dramatic case in Poland Keith had to grab a child off the street and then hid her under a car seat as he made a mad dash for freedom. But let's go back to where it all began. It all started when Keith received a panicked call from the mother. I went to Poland with the mother from Brisbane. She had two children there who were in... uh uh, taken by the father and just left with the grandmother and again the father didn't uh, really want the children it was just spite against the mother and to get a, get away with the the children so it was a matter of con- going to Poland confirming the children were there and on the day we found the uh, children we only found one of them and uh, was able to get her out of uh, back out of Poland, we we did have documentation, so I was able to take them to the uh, embassy and get a new travel document for her, and uh, we we got out of uh, flew out of Poland before uh, the father knew, Ellen, before there were any uh, orders, any restraint orders, and the mother thought she would never see her. Uh, uh, that, that was the son, sorry. She thought she would never see her daughter again. So four weeks later, I said to her, come on, and I was just before Christmas, we're going back to Poland, we're going to get uh, get your daughter. She said, how can we? They'll know we're coming. I said, I'll work out a way. Leave it to me. And we went back, waited uh, ac- across the road. There was a cemetery. We waited in the cemetery, and that afternoon saw the little girl come down the road coming back from school heading home and just as she arrived we uh, got out of the car and grabbed her and I had my 12 year old son with me uh, just for adventure and his job was to uh, give the little girl a drink that had a sedative in it and in case she was too upset just to calm her down it was a prescribed sediment uh, uh, not sediment, uh, uh, prescribed uh, medication from uh, the the doctor to uh, calm her down. 
But she didn't need it. She uh, she calmed down fairly quickly. I took off with her, <clears throat> with her in the car, and I ended up in a one-way street uh, with a barricade across the end. Uh, wasn't time to turn around because uh, police were in the area, so I just crashed through the uh, the barricade and kept going. And then I was chased by the police heading back towards the border of uh, Germany. And at one stage, we were doing 170 kilometres an hour. Uh, it was late evening, and all I could see was the police blue lights flashing, getting further and further behind, because their old cars back in the 90s didn't uh, didn't do 170k an hour, and I beat them uh, to the border, had the little girl hidden under the seat of the car, and uh, she was very still and just laid there. The uh, guards on the Polish side of the border asked for our passports and visas. They looked at them and went inside, and I thought they're going to uh, do something or there may be an alert. But uh, they came back and waved us through and the uh, guards on the other side handed our passports back and uh, we were safe. We were out out, out of the place and a uh, little uh, girl and uh, her brother came back to Australia and uh, I have had contact from them now and again the little boy when he was a young teenager uh, and he was like only about five or six at the time when he was a teenager he was very very uh, radical and abusive towards his mother and uh, it really had played up mentally with him but one day uh, when he was 14 he went to his mother put his arms around her apologized and uh, said mum I'm sorry for treating you the way I have uh, Keith did a great job and I, I thank him as well. Now those children have grown up now and have great uh, careers ahead of them in, in Australia. It must have been a heart-stopping moment wondering what comes next. Well, that's right. Uh, I was looking at the border and uh, the security and thought, do I do I take off now or when they come back to arrest me, do I get going and leave, leave it up to them? But it, it, it was. It was... Uh, uh, a little bit stressing, but I'm a person who uh, has no fear or had no fear of anyone or anything. I was quite capable of taking care of myself uh, and had some good training during my Air Force days to be able to protect myself and knew just what to do. That must be very important because you've had a lot of hair raising cases, haven't you? Are there others that you can tell us about? Well, there are, and uh, there were cases where I needed the support of uh, local intelligence, uh, the intelligence people from countries, uh, uh, from the Secret Service and uh, CIA type people. And I've had meetings with uh, uh, clandestine meetings with CIA personnel and uh, have arranged or prearranged uh, assistance if I needed it. If things failed, I could always call on them and... Uh, could be assured that no harm would come to me or the parent I was working for. And 80% of the cases was for the uh, for the mother, or probably 85% of the cases I worked for the mother and the other few were for the fathers. Failed rescue missions put everyone in the team in danger. Child recovery investigators have been attacked, shot at, jailed and even gone missing and never been heard from again. I was jailed in Yemen, but have not been jailed in, in another country. I've been delayed and uh, questioned and held for a day, but I've been able to make contact with my uh, uh, persons of uh, assistance to be able to uh, uh, help me get on my way, if, if I can say it that way, where no further questioning would take place. Was there any moment in any of those um, child abduction cases that you thought, this is it for me? No, not uh, not particularly. Uh, I uh, always felt uh, secure and positive that what I was doing was correct and uh, that I would succeed. And knowing of the support I had, uh, I'd make it through. 
if I had have felt that way, that this is it for me, I wouldn't have been doing those sort of cases. And there's a case in Fiji where uh, I went there for a mother who was living in Australia and uh, found the little boy, in fact, interviewed the father, spoke with the father, had uh, photographs of myself, uh, gave some presents to the little boy just to find out where he went to school and where he was going. And uh, would you believe the next morning when we were to pick up the little boy, I couldn't find the mother. She had gone off with some guy she met the night before who were told her that if we tried that, we'd end up in jail and all sorts of things would happen. So uh, couldn't find her, so we couldn't get... That. And that's the only other case where I didn't succeed because the uh, mother disappeared. Anyway, she ended up on the same flight as us back to Australia, didn't want to speak to us. Uh, uh, a couple of the uh, television channels were waiting at the airport to interview her, and uh, she just refused. And it was only later on that I found out what had taken place, that she met this uh, guy, a British guy, who was doing some work in Fiji, who told her that she shouldn't be doing it, that she'd be arrested and go to jail. And uh, she didn't get those children back uh, n until some years later. One of the most notorious cases of child abduction in Australia involved the Malaysian prince, Raja Bahrain Shah, smuggling his two children out of Australia. Their mother, Jacqueline Gillespie, didn't see them again for 14 years. Keith was initially consulted about the case but he knew it would be almost impossible to get them back. I was, in the beginning, I was consulted, but that's one of the cases I thought the, uh, the, the Shah was probably more entitled to the children. And I, I didn't know the full uh, story of the case at that stage. And I know it, it would have been a difficult case to uh, succeed. It would have had to have been a real commando-style uh, entry and commando-style raid to get those children out. And uh, it was just after, after that or partway through it, I had uh, produced a documentary uh, where a producer followed me around the world on some cases and uh, we were in the studio in Melbourne uh, editing the documentary and uh, Jack Jackie Gillespie was sitting up in the back of the studio wat watching us. I didn't know she was there, but the producer, uh, Terry Carline, who uh, did the documentary, saw her there and recognised her watching us uh, do the editing. Hmm. And, and that case, of course, she never did get the children back. No, and I believe they came back as adults and uh, reunited with her or got to know her. There was also another very famous case most recently about the um, 60 Minutes Lebanon uh, child abduction case, which also was unsuccessful and went very badly for everyone involved. The Foreign Minister says she'll speak to Lebanese authorities about the Australians who were arrested after a botched attempt to return two children to Brisbane. The children's mother and a 60 Minutes crew remain in custody in Beirut and a decision on charges will be made soon. Julie Bishop is warning that Lebanese authorities are taking the case very seriously. Did you follow that case very closely? I did and again I was consulted on that case uh, early in the piece and had not made a decision and uh, then I learned that uh, 60 Minutes were going to uh, do the case and uh, about two years or two and a half years prior to that 60 Minutes came with me on a case to Turkey. Uh, they funded the case to the mother and paid for uh, my fees and came to Turkey. But I, I wouldn't allow them to be up front with their cameras and filming and exposing themselves. They uh, had to stay in the background, keep out of the way. I had secret camera with me with a high definition recording that uh, was secreted and I got all the uh, high definition footage they needed. And again, we escaped off... Uh, the beach at Bodrum in a boat over to Coz and 60 Minutes were waiting over on Coz to film the landing of the uh, the mother and the child and uh, followed back to Australia. That documentary did not go to air because the father came back from Turkey and had a court order uh, put on it to uh, 
uh, stop it from being aired. But uh, yeah, and I think the problem in uh, Syria was that uh, uh, 60 Minutes probably overexposed themselves out on the street with big cameras and uh, and whatever, and didn't try to uh, uh, treat it as uh, an undercover secret operation. And you think that that was probably a major flaw in the plan, was that they exposed themselves? I, I do uh, believe it was the major flaw where they overexposed themselves with uh, who, who they were and what they were doing. And uh, there was no uh, secret uh, uh, operation beforehand. And I think if I had have done that, I may have gone there by myself much earlier, much sooner. And... Uh, to find where the children were and to set up how I would be getting out and speak to my contacts there. uh, And I do have some really good contacts in Lebanon who who would have uh, uh, secreted me out. Tell me, do you have um, for tips for parents um, who might be in a situation where they fear their partner might abduct their children? Do you, do you have any tips for them about how to keep your children safe? Well, the only, the only thing is to make sure they've got orders uh, not to uh, allow their children out of the country, uh, alerts at immigration at the airport, uh, but... And the father, in one case I know not so long ago, he had passports in uh, in other names, uh, in his family name, where he didn't use the Australian passports, but he was caught uh, at the airport and the children uh, retrieved from him. But uh, you know, if uh, a father or a mother wants to get out of the country with the children, uh, I guess there's ways of doing it to... Uh, and, and I, I've been approached by people to help them smuggle children out of Australia and get them away from the other party, but I just won't be involved in that sort of thing. It's not ethical, and uh, uh, that's just not, not me. That's interesting. Have you been um, approached many times? No, two or three occasions. Uh, once was by an American father and uh, he wanted me to help him smuggle his children out of Australia. And uh, I, I just refused. He, he tried, but got caught. And I think you've said that you look at each case carefully before you make a decision. And what are the, things, what are the factors that you weigh up to, to sway you one way or the other whether you're going to take on a case? I do uh, go to the extent of uh, looking at all court documentation in place. I'll go and interview neighbours. I'll speak to uh, uh, the they're, they're church-going people. I'll speak to the, uh, the the church and the community, the school teachers, just just to get some idea of how the children have been treated. And uh, a lot of knowledge can be gained that way. And just getting getting back to the Lebanon case, I had a lady in Australia here who uh, had gone to Lebanon with her husband and the children, and he wouldn't uh, allow her to leave. Uh, he kept her passport and the children's passport. Through my contacts, I was able to organise for her to be picked up in a uh, security car, Uh, that had black windows, blackened out windows, so she had to be waiting at a certain spot in Lebanon and was picked up and was driven across the border uh, by these security people without any documentation. Then she was able to go to the Australian uh, uh, embassy in the country she was taken to to get travel documents. So I didn't have to leave Australia to do that. That must take really good contacts to get yourself out of Lebanon without paperwork. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, it's just more or less everyday happenings with me that uh, I've built up that reputation, I've built up those contacts over many years. In our next episode, we will meet Maria Smith, the private investigator and debt collector. She has an alter ego, a bat phone, a car with 007 number plates and a raft of disguises. She says her cover as a private eye has never been blown.